Thank you very much. Good to be here. Well, I mean, uh, I have two kids under six and a vegetarian wife, so it's good to be anywhere but home. <laughs> Settle down. Some of these are jokes, okay? Some of these are jokes. I love my kids. <laughs> Some of these are jokes. The rest is hate speech. <laughs> so did you guys enjoy the European Parliament election results? Sounds like a good time to rejoin the EU, doesn't it? <laughs> I'd like to see Nigel Farage back in, the par in this parliament, in a new parliament, right? Thanks for the floor, Mr. Speaker. I must say my fellow honorable colleagues have been relentlessly bullying me all day, calling me a globalist sellout. I was debanked for crying out loud. Just because I said Western Indian immigration was good doesn't mean I am a traitor to my race. <laughs> Nigel Farage said Western Indian immigration was good. He said a lot of them fought alongside British forces in the world wars. Well, if they had the same fighting commitment that Rishi Sunak showed on D-Day celebration <laughs> ceremony, <laughs> I don't think there's much credit to be taken for Western Indian immigration, right? So we just celebrated the D-Day, the bravest boys, the bravery of the bravest boys who bravely stormed the beaches of Normandy. So we celebrate their eternal bravery, but only after the bravery of fat female pop singers. <laughs> foul-mouthed uh, female comics, uh, uh, the bravery of gender-confused people, and George Floyd. <laughs> so that's the hierarchy of bravery. But those boys were so brave, and thanks to them, we aren't speaking any German now. <laughs> well, I'm, I speak German, I speak German, and it's all right speaking, I mean, okay, it's not all right. It's not all right, because when you speak German, you are constantly conscious of the fact that you are speaking the same language as the most evil man in the history of Europe, Klaus Schwab. <laughs> True story. Right. Um, some people have criticized me for writing notes on my hands. You know, I thought maybe from now on, whenever I forget my lines, I go like, like this. <laughs> so the White House press secretary will defend me. <laughs> Something tells me that of all the shots, Comedy Unleashed team are going to choose that shot for the thumbnail of my video. Right, uh, this is a nice crowd of just over 200 civilians, I would say. So for the sake of safety, is anybody among you holding or hiding an Israeli hostage? <laughs> I have a degree in international security from Birkbeck College, University of London, which uh, taught me that uh, one way to increase your chances of being attacked by IDF as a civilian is to hold or hide Israeli hostages. <laughs> While if you do not hold or hide any Israeli hostages as a civilian, your chances of getting attacked by IDF uh, decline drastically. <laughs> okay, so we can proceed. <laughs> yeah. Now, let's talk about race, uh, space race. Um, they have built me in the Comedy Unleashed newsletter as somebody who does always new material, so that kind of ties my hands, so. Uh, I'm contractually obligated to do new material. If you remember, two, uh, last summer, India successfully landed a lunar probe on the surface of the moon. That was the first, that was the first time. And two weeks ago, China successfully landed a lunar probe on the far side of the moon. And that was their first time. And only two days ago, Pakistan successfully landed 24 terrorists <laughs> on the surface of Afghanistan. It was not their first time. <laughs> right.
right. I know what you're all thinking about. Uh, this summer we celebrate the 75th anniversary of NATO. How about that? Yeah, I knew that. I knew that. Um, you know, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, you know him. Uh, he said it is not up to Russia if NATO wants to expand into Ukraine. It is only up to NATO and Ukraine if NATO wants to expand into Ukraine. And I thought, that doesn't sound right, because Russia is a superpower. Ukraine is in their backyard. They used to be the same country in the old times, and they used to be the same country in the modern times. They have 2,000 kilometers land border, and 20% of uh, Ukrainians are ethnic Russian. They share the same DNA. And now you're saying, Mr. Stoltenberg, that it's not up to Russia? Because I remember in 2020, I wanted to expand my kitchen into my back garden. <laughs> and I was legally obligated to ask for permission from my next door neighbor, Greg. <laughs> And Greg, Greg is a nice guy, uh, I should say, um, but he's not a superpower. And we don't have 2,000 kilometers shared border, and 20% of my household do not share Greg's DNA. <laughs> they better not share Greg's DNA. <laughs> but now we want to expand and admit Ukraine. Ukraine was so corrupt that until 25 minutes ago, they were not even a candidate, but now, EU and NATO want to admit them just to spite Russia. Just to spite Russia, they want to admit Ukraine. And this reminds me of when your teenage daughter wants to spite you so she just starts dating a dodgy black guy. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. There are some black guys with, with good jobs and good houses, but they don't live in my area. <laughs> You know, black guys with, with good jobs and good, beautiful houses mostly live in this place called TV commercials. <laughs> right? What are they trying to tell us with all these TV commercials? Huh? What, are they, what is the message? Black guys with good jobs and beautiful houses prefer white women. <laughs> that seems to be the message. Right. Um, I guess... What I'm trying to say is that it's hard to have sex. Uh, no, seriously. Um, people tell me, how come you couldn't uh, get laid in college? Uh, you were Italian for crying out loud. And I, I, I say, well, I was Italian. I was born in Italy. I went to college in Italy. So I was Italian, but so was everyone else. <laughs> so your edge kind of wears off when everybody is Italian. But, but the main reason, let's not kid about it, the main reason I couldn't, I, I missed out on so much sex at university, um, well, I blame George W. Bush. <laughs> Hear me out, because I uh, started university in 2001, and that's when George W. Bush decided to go inside Afghanistan and Iraq. And I supported him. And I was the only one at university. And the reason George W. Bush and I believe that it was a good idea is that George W. Bush and I are not racist. We believe people all over the world are essentially the same, and they want the same thing, they want the same for their children, you know, uh, happiness and prosperity and sending their kids to college. You've all heard this, but George W. Bush and I started this, actually. <laughs> They just, want, they just want freedom. They, people want freedom everywhere. People want freedom and free market, and they want to send their kids to college. And it has been done before. I was telling my friends, like, they did it in Germany, they did it in Italy, they did it in Japan, you know. You just go there, remove the tyrant, free market, pump a lot of money, infrastructure, and there you go. You have democracy and freedom, and kids go to college. And these racists, would you believe, they were like, no, no, just because it happened in Germany and Italy and Japan, do you think it can be done in Iraq and Afghanistan? And I thought, that's so racist. But, you know, looking back 20 years on, <laughs> I think I'm a 
I'm big enough a man to look back and admit that racists were right. <laughs> when you look at it, it, it looks like not, not everybody wants to send their kids to college. Some people just want to send their kids to an Israeli music festival. <laughs> to kill the kids who go to college, right? And some other parents want to send their kids to college to go on hunger strike in support of those who went to the Israeli music <laughs> festival to kill the college. So it's a complex picture. <laughs> there is a compli complexity that George W. Bush and I failed to grasp at that time. <laughs> right, so mixed feelings about um, George W. Bush. Do you guys like sports? <laughs> hey, um, Paris Olympics are coming up. Um, you know, um, Jerm, thank you for the <laughs> putting too much pressure on me if you laugh on the premise like that. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Um, you know, Germany's female gymnastics team, they decided to ditch their leotards for unitards. They've swapped their leotards with unitards. Now they're going to cover um, shoulder to ankles. They're covering their legs, essentially. Legs were bare, now they're gonna be covered. And they said they're doing this to combat objectification of women. <laughs> objectification, legs are gonna be covered. So for any of you perverts who were hoping to <laughs> catch an eyeful of their long, bare, supple legs, this is bad news. <laughs> However, if you were hoping to look at their camel toes, it's yeah. business as usual. <laughs> <laughs> They're covering the legs. Yeah. Covering. Have you seen gymnastics kits? <laughs> They're covering the legs. Uh, but, I mean, objectification, I don't get this. What's wrong with objectification? <laughs> Who doesn't want to be objectified? In, hear me out. What is objective? Objectification means, this is the definition, all right? Let's not. Objectification means I find this person desirable, hypothetically, if certain conditions were met. <laughs> Mutatis, mutandis is the legal Latin term, mutatis mutandis. If every other condition that needed to be met were indeed met. Like, I, I see this person, I say, okay, if she were available and I were available and my wife had died two years ago <laughs> or before after a long debilitating illness, with me being by her side throughout the time, lovingly and caringly, and Arsenal were not playing tonight. I would, I would, it's conditional. It's basic English grammar. It's conditional, right? Mutatis mutandis. Now, who wouldn't want to be objective? If you don't believe me, try this with any person of your choice, right? Go to any person of your choice and say something like, hey, Amanda, can I have a word with you? Yeah, this is good, you're gonna love this. Uh, listen, Amanda, how, how long have you been calling? Six, okay, six months. Listen, when I look at you, I don't find you desirable, <laughs> even hypothetically, <laughs> under any circumstances, I'm hard pressed to think of any scenario, any situation in which I would desire to see you naked. <laughs> Never mind have sexual congress with you. I just wanted to put this out. And I, I, I don't know, but I bet Amanda will not be happy to, <laughs> to hear this. When I look at you, sex is the last thing that crosses my, my mind. But there's so much wokeism, we have to combat objectification. You know, it's, dating is hard. Um, you know, it's, it's because this is Pride Month, right? I hope none of this has been covered by Leo before because we usually cover the same territory. <laughs> and I came a bit late. Uh, of course, he's more good looking than me, but um, on the other hand, my accent is more understandable. <laughs> so I have that on him. Um, no, um, I'm, I'm glad I'm not dating nowadays because 
when you're dating nowadays, it's so easy to become gay, right? <laughs> you know, because when it comes to dating women, you know, my absolute red line is lack of penis. You know, <laughs> uh, penis is a deal breaker. But according to new established woke canons, uh, even if she has a penis, it's a woman's penis. So if you don't go for it, you are gay. You can easily become gay. So, so dating is tough on men. Uh, wokeism is tough on men. If you think it's tough on men, it's tougher on women. Because women nowadays, you know, their spaces are being invaded. Their sports results are being smashed. And some women even can catch prostate cancer nowadays. <laughs> so it's, it's tough out there. So, so, so last year in the Netherlands, Miss Netherlands was transgender, right? This was a historic uh, development. So for the first time in history, Dutch men were saying, I'd rather have sex with my own wife <laughs> than with Miss Netherlands. <laughs> That had never happened before. And there's this TV show in Germany called Germany's Next Top Model, uh, presented by uh, former top model Heidi Klum. And last year, all three last finalists were totally non-Germanic, and the final winner was non-Germanic and very, very plus-sized. So German men are saying, <laughs> I'd rather have sex with my own wife. No, I'd rather, I'd rather invade Russia <laughs> in the dead of winter <laughs> than have sex with Germany's next top model. So, so, so wokeism can have very negative geopolitical consequences. <laughs> and this year, this year Miss Germany was actually Iranian, not even born in, in uh, Germany. Born in Iran, uh, 39 years old, already a mother, and she was not uh, easy on the eye. <laughs> like, honestly. So, so Germans obviously went mad and they, were, they didn't like it. Iranians didn't like it. They were like, is this the best you think our country <laughs> can offer? What's the matter with you? Is this? Covert racism? <laughs> so, so Iranian embassy in Berlin had to issue a statement, you know. They said, the statement said, now you see why we asked them to cover up? <laughs> Turns out the Iranian regime was misunderstood. <laughs> All these years we thought it's a despotic, theocracy trampling over women's, uh, women's basic uh, rights and freedoms. Turns out, throughout all these years, they were just looking out for all of us. Uh, how, how interested are you in uh, German supermarket wars? I, I tell you, because when this thing happened, like the Iranian Miss Germany was uh, selected and she was not easy on the eye, uh, there was a meme trend launched by German Twitter fans, and on Twitter or X, they all started putting a random cashier girl from their local Aldi supermarket next to the new Miss Germany, saying, look, random Aldi checkout girl, prettier than Miss Germany. What is that? Which is like, what's up with that? And so Aldi got a lot of free publicity. Now L Lidl was fuming. <laughs> and to make things worse for Lidl, you know what happened? They had, to, they had to recall four kinds of children's biscuits from their shelves. Did you know that? Uh, because it turned, these four kinds of children's biscuits on the packaging, there was a website for uh, consulting the nutritional values. But it turned out when you click on the website, it's actually a porn site. <laughs> That's the last thing Lidl needed. I mean, can you imagine these poor kids? 
These poor kids, it's Pride Month, they are exposed to all sorts of sexual behavior on the streets, and then <laughs> under the guise of sex education, they are exposed to all sorts of sexual content at school, and then they have trans, uh, trans storytelling time, and then they turn on channel four, again, they have sex ed and naked education, and all that. They're expo and, and then they want to consult the nutritional values of <laughs> their biscuits. And they see more sexual, con and this is much worse because this time on the porn side, the sexual content is actually performed by people who are attractive. <laughs> so it can actually attract the kids and reel them in, whereas previously it would maybe put them off, you know, all, all the things they see. Yeah, kids. Um, now, I think uh, I, I should end on some American politics, if that's all right with you guys. Yeah, Stormy Daniels. Uh, <laughs> thanks for laughing, but... <laughs> um, yeah, I was uh, following the... I mean, this, this was Stormy Daniels, for those of you who are not uh, familiar. She allegedly, she was a high-end escort who allegedly had sex with Trump for money and then allegedly signed a non-disclosure agreement for even more money, <laughs> and then reneged the non-disclosure for a book deal and even more money. <laughs> and it all became so sad, Trump denying what Stormy said and Stormy denying what Trump said. And I thought, this is so depressing. Is this the world where I want to raise my children, where I can no longer trust the integrity of a high-end escort? <laughs> I mean, when you can no longer trust the word of a high-end escort, what can you expect from these cheap a dime a dozen crack whores? <laughs> yeah, it's just one of the one of the cases they've dumped on Trump. This this government is a is a disgrace. Uh, but, I mean, it's not really Biden. Everybody says Obama. It's, this is the third Obama administration. He's behind the, you know, curtains. But, but even Obama got into trouble. You know, a short while ago, a biography of Barack Obama uh, made headlines. Because it's a non-flattering, it's a not-so-flattering biography. It's called The Making of Obama by David Garrow. And David Garrow is no ordinary biographer. He won a Pulitzer for writing the biography of Martin Luther King. It's that kind of caliber, right? And in this biography, he talks about the early years of Obama, the making of Barack Obama, and he has sourced original handwritten letters by Barack Obama at that time in college, uh, writing to his then college girlfriend, telling her that he frequently fantasizes about sex with other men. This is in the biography, right? So when this came out, all American conservative commentators, they went berserk. They were like, this is a big deal. Why aren't the media, mainstream media, they are not, why aren't they all over this, right? It's a big deal. And I thought, I mean, I'm, I'm no Obama fan, as you might have guessed, but <laughs> is this a big deal, really? He, he frequently fantasizes about sex with other men. I fantasize about sex with other men every day. <laughs> and I'm not attracted to men. I'm just attracted to the possibility of sex with someone intelligent. <laughs> okay. This guy has been looking daggers at me all throughout the set and now he's giving me the applause. Okay, so finally I won you over. I think this is as, as good a time as any for me to leave the stage. Thanks for listening. I've been Nicholas DeSanto.